Hello, I'm Beryl Dakers. Welcome to Palmetto Scene. It's Women's History Month, and we here at ETV are taking the time to celebrate the unique talents and accomplishments of some of our state's truly amazing individuals. First, we'll visit the upstate, where we find two talented artists who found a unique way to express themselves during the pandemic. They believe that art connects the human to the human and is the ultimate form of human expression. Art is to me a universal part of self-expression uh, that human beings have, just like music and other things. And I think it's there within all people. The story behind the pieces is very important because that connects the human to the human. And I think there's so many millions and millions of levels of human expression through art, from the great masters down to just the scribbles of the petroglyphs, for example. They're all important. And it's all that human being behind it that's making it important. South Carolina artist and Winthrop alumna Nancy Thomas Wofford reconnected to her classical art roots and set up a Michelangelo cast in her Greenville studio. I think that the cast is a fundamental beginning to learning how to observe the natural world around you. And the art student in that process is more aware of how to translate the natural world into the practice of drawing. The human mind has more capability than we realize. So in trying to tackle a difficult task like this exercise, you do get a sense of accomplishment and encouragement to go further. It automatically improves draftsmanship and uh, that improvement in draftsmanship will stay with you technically for the rest of your life. Nancy invited the O'Neill family to do a cast drawing exercise with her. One line changes the entire drawing and all the relationships change and that's why we have to correct so many times. Where it's really helping me is, you know, it goes so far down the abstract uh, wormhole, even though I, I layer a lot of realism and I, I've got a classical background, um, I haven't done a cast drawing since, I don't know, like 30 years. So getting to go back to, to the basics and the classical realm, what it really helps me is with perspective from looking at one point and how things can change. What our instructor always said, uh, told us we need to do, come in and take the first minute and just look at your cast drawing with a fresh eye and that is when you capture so many of the things that you didn't see when you left it the day before. No matter the medium or genre of art you fancy, cast drawing is often considered a must-have experience to unlock an artist's potential. Jimmy O'Neill echoes the sentiment. I am an artist and I'm pushing the boundaries of paint. I developed a, a paint that is a mirrored paint um, about 20 years ago and have still been pushing different ways of making that a lens because since I'm now working with a camera embedded in a painting and wanting the viewer to see themselves as that painting, perspective becomes important. It's just good to get your chops up again, you know, and, and do something that's completely out of the realm or unexercised space that I've been in. And also getting to work with somebody like Nancy who's <laughs> amazing, you know. I'm in awe of what she does. When I take a measure, you know, horizontally across the tip of the whole thing, you've got all of your basic critical horizontals and verticals matching up really beautifully. Cast drawing is a setup uh, in the studio situation where you would be using a cast, a white plaster cast of, of usually a famous Greek or Roman figure and it's placed on a pedestal and you have your drawing, your easel and your drawing uh, paper next to it and uh, there's a process that you go through to um, align that piece with your paper and 
use your charcoal to replicate that. And it requires a tremendous amount of observation, correcting, going back and remeasuring. And your goal is to get an exact replica. The O'Neill kids teamed up to draw the cast, with a little help from Nancy, of course. I feel like this was a very powerful experience for my sister and I as, uh, as friends and as artists. We, we got to work together with Nancy to create this piece and we learned so much because I never even used a plumb line before and now I'm like, that's all you need. Even without traditional art training, the O'Neill kids took a lot away from this experience. I learned so much from this process because Nancy, she taught us how to be active in our learning and go back and forth from being away from the piece and towards the piece. So it's very much an active process with the teacher. I'm going to take a look at it through your rectangle. I think when you learn not only the technical um, aspect of your exercise and what you're trying to accomplish, but as you work this form, um, this particular figure, you start becoming emotionally involved in that form and then historically you begin to think about that character in history. So it enriches your art history as well. Nancy says that during the Renaissance, the scholars realized that the classical Greeks had come to a deep understanding of the nature of beauty through figurative art. Therefore, beauty was in the antique for them. Art students had to master the antique before being allowed to draw from the life. As time progressed, a certain, let's call them famous characters in Greek and Roman history were preferred by the artists. And so they became the standards that were used over and over again through the centuries in Europe as the atelier and as the classical instruction progressed. So I think that Belvedere torso that Michelangelo so adored would be a good example of that, the Venus de Milo, uh, others that we see repeated over and over again. And they were beautiful and they were learning tools for how to represent beauty and perfection of the form. Michelangelo is probably uh, my favorite of artists and, and has been since art school days. But I think the dying slave or dying captive, as it's sometimes called, represents a condition in humanity and uh, has great emotion to it. And I wanted to have an opportunity to try to try to learn how he did that, to capture his genius as an artist, as, as he was trying to give us an emotion at that time. Emotion is ever present, from the original Renaissance artist's feelings, to the student executing a cast drawing and sharing a piece of themselves in the replica. I think the Venus cast for me is probably my most important piece because uh, it was my it was my second cast drawing, but um, it was done at a time that my father was leaving us, and I had great pleasure in working on that piece. So I think it imbues a kind of emotion in the work itself that was not in the plaster model and um, expressed some emotional feelings that I had at the time. Can you feel the emotion? Next, we're heading to Columbia to meet Tamika Isaac Devine, an attorney, city councilwoman, wife, mother of three, and the founder of the Possibilities Institute, who is now on a mission to become the first female mayor of our capital city, and in so doing, show young women that with the right spirit, you can have it all. Have you ever wondered how to integrate work family life, and your passion without missing a beat? Well, Tamika Isaac Devine is doing just that and showing others how to do it as well. 
We caught up with Miss Devine at a book signing with her daughter Jade, already a children's author, who says she's proud of her mom. I am proud of her because um, she's she's just not a councilwoman. She is um, she's a mother. She is a lawyer. She's a coach, and how she can juggle all that stuff. So basically, every day, it's just so amazing how she does all that stuff. She does all that stuff and shows others how to do it with the Possibilities Institute, according to her husband, Jamie Devine. The Possibilities Institute is an organization that was founded by Tamika um, several years ago. She wants to empower women, uh, in particular uh, coach women, offer speaking services um, to the community. And she um, uh, wants ladies to have the integrated work-life situation where you can have it all. You can, you can have the work life, you can have the family, and you can have um, all that, that you want. And so as her support, as her helpmate, um, I'm here to support her because this is her dream, this is what she wants to do. And so I just want to make sure that she's the best at whatever she does. As an attorney specializing in the areas of real estate, probate, and business transactions, Tamika gets glowing reviews from clients like Laura Mejio Gonzalez. This was the first time I bought a house with my husband. Um, we just got married a year ago, um, and she's just so helpful. Um, she was there every step of the process. Um, she did everything on time. Uh, she is always there every time you need her. Um, she's just a great attorney. I would recommend her to anybody. Is there a process that if a neighborhood or community feels The like first African-American woman to serve and be elected to Columbia City Council at large in 2002, Tamika Isaac Devine is hard at work alongside Mayor Steve Benjamin in her role as Columbia's Mayor Pro Tem. When she's not at City Council, Miss Devine teaches other women just how to do all she does. The mastermind class has helped me in so many different ways. Uh, this session has really expounded upon how to integrate work and life and just finding the joy in what you do. It's not separating out the work with your life. It's pulling it all together and just enjoying the journey for what it is. Making sure that you have that time to get things done and accomplish. So being a part of this mastermind class, it has helped me to be able to look at things in a different light and to expound upon those strategies that she has taught. Tamika says her life experience is what made her want to champion and support women in their quest to have it all, which is why she created the Possibilities Institute. I kept getting people asking me kind of, Tamika, how do you do it all? And I realized that if more and more people consistently came to me asking about the same thing, that that was a void that maybe people weren't speaking to and actually mentoring and helping people with figuring out how can you still follow your professional dreams as well as have the things that you're passionate about and then also have a very happy and fulfilled home life. And so the Possibilities Institute just really grew out of that passion to want to help and support and empower other women on how do you have that type of lifestyle? How do you, you know, go after your career or work in the community and still keep your family and your personal life um, back first? Um, so that's kind of how it came out and it has grown um, really beyond what I, I, I imagined. So it really is truly something I think that when you say when God gives you a vision, you just have to be obedient and follow it. It's something I really feel like I had to follow and he has blessed me and my clients and being able to really give me a passion behind supporting other people in having the life that they want. And now this story, just in time for March Madness. From a small town gym in Hartsville, South Carolina, to the hallowed Hall of Fame of women's basketball in Knoxville, Tennessee, Beth Bass's magical journey shows that the old-fashioned values of hard work and determination can still reap big-time rewards in today's modern society. She was the CEO of the Women's Basketball Coaches Association for 15 years. 
the WBCA's effort to launch the KL Cancer Fund. She received the President's Award from the National Association of Girls and Women in Sport. She received the award for honor from ETSU in 1998, which is given to alumni with outstanding accomplishment. Ladies and gentlemen, 2019 Women's Basketball Hall of Fame inductee, Beth Bass. Hartsville, South Carolina is a special place, obviously. I'm very, I'm very uh, partial to it. Some of the people I met there and grew up with, that I've stayed very much in touch, to, touch with, always love to go back. Um, I used to always uh, kind of be embarrassed where I was from because it, with my accent, my first job was up, up at Converse in Boston. So you can imagine the grief I got um, and I said, oh, they asked me where you're from and I said, you know, kind of apologetically, I, um, I'm from a small town. You never heard of it. But it was about an hour and a half inland from Myrtle Beach because everybody knows where Myrtle Beach is. And he says, "Don't you ever apologize for being from a small town?" He goes, "He says small towns. Thank God for small towns, where there wouldn't be any real people in the world." Back when I came along, we didn't even have a middle school, uh, junior high. Of course, we couldn't play. That wasn't legal, but we could practice with the team. So I was a senior, and Beth was a seventh grader. And so um, Beth would literally run from the junior high school, which was, I don't know if it was about a mile or so away. And um, we had to do warm ups back then. And, you know, the seniors, you know, we don't like doing all that stuff. And here comes Beth Bass running in the front door and she just keeps right on running. We said, look at that little kid, you know. And we knew that at that point that, that she had something and she was gonna be great. God talk about Pat Hewitt, right? And so I was down at the other end on the far there at the, at the old gym, red and black, and uh, I saw her walking up to me in that, you know, those, those eyes and that stride, and the, you can just feel the energy and the charisma and the, the you know, authority. And she came and said, what's your name? And I'm, Beth Bass, you know. And she said, well, you stick with me, I'll make you a superstar. And I meant like right there, it was like lightning struck me. and. Uh, just somebody was gonna believe in me and teach me as much as I could hold. I just knew she had true grit. She'd be a great player. You know, she's self-driven. You don't have to motivate Beth. She's motivated. She really is. Um, she always wants to get better. She sets goals. You know, I used to ask my players every day, what are you, what are you doing here today? What's your purpose? What are you trying to improve on? Every day you should be able to tell me something that you're working on to get better at. I didn't have to tell Beth. She was self-motivated, she was self-driven. I knew it was coming, it had to be, you know, that she would be a uh, Hall of Famer. And so when she called and told me, I was elated. I mean, I just cried. <laughs> and I was just so excited for her and I thought, how befitting that it's come full circle. And she's always giving back to basketball. You know, she first started with Converse and then went to Nike and then WBCA hired as executive director. And then she retired and Adidas said, mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then for this to come at the top of all of that, um, it's just uh, icing on the cake. This is my favorite part of my little bungalow here in Atlanta, Georgia, because it makes me feel like I'm in Hartsville, South Carolina. But I've got all my best buds. I've got my Hartsville High Red Fox here. I've got a Gator fan. I don't know how that happened. I've got an Arizona Wildcat fan. They get to come. And this is my favorite. You know, Pat Summit, Dr. J, when you ask people what makes them so good at something, you're like, that's it. You know, and that, Pat, you make sure you know the custodian, you make sure you know the loading dock person, you know, you make sure you know the academic advisor that's gonna save you. I mean, like, everybody's important. It takes all, and everybody's just as important as the next person. And she was, ex Pat was extremely humble.
like I said, never played for her, but we, had, we just had a special relationship and she just kind of took me in to her little tribe. Not a day goes by I don't think about her. I was uh, with a, a, a group of great friends when I got the call that I was going in. You have to keep it quiet until it was announced. So it was really like a ride. You're just hearing from people. I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. I'm supposed to be on LinkedIn. And it just all blew up, you know. It was just people like I haven't heard from in years. And that was really fun. And Pat Summit said it so well. I might not get the numbers right, but you know, I've won eight national championships. I won 1,038 games, 18 SEC titles, whatever. She says, but what I remember are the people's faces and smiles that were there with me on the journey, you know? And that's how I felt like. Like, I was kind of like in a, you know, not, a, not a, you shouldn't think of funk, but it's just kind of like surreal because you're so busy and you want to see everybody. Um, so now when I look back through the, all the pictures and hear from people, everybody was having a, a great time. I don't think Hartswell even understands, and I didn't understand until I came, what a big deal this is. I mean, we have somebody from Hartswell, South Carolina, who's in the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. And we've spent the weekend here at the Hall of Fame. You know, we all thought we knew Beth, and we all knew that she was a contributor. We all knew that she cared about her community. She cares about her country. But until we came here this weekend and saw what these other people saw in her and the other things that she's achieved, I don't even think we understood what a big deal this was. So for Hartsville, South Carolina, this is a big deal. God, if there's a little Beth Bass out there in Hartsville, South Carolina, what would I tell her? I would tell her the sky's the limit and it's just surround herself with good people, good friends, good influencers and mentors and listen to them, but also listen to that small voice inside of yourself that you know that you can do it. For more stories about our state and, of course, more details on the stories you've just seen, please visit our website at palmettoscene.org. And, of course, don't forget to follow us on social media, whether Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, at SCETV, hashtag Palmetto Scene. We leave you now with tonight's Palmetto postcard from the Swamp Rabbit Trail of the Upstate. For Palmetto Scene, I'm Beryl Dakers. Good night. And thanks for watching. The Swamp Rabbit Trail Network is a, essentially a road without cars. Today we're at the Swamp Rabbit Cafe and Grocery at mile marker 32 um, on the green line of the Prisma Health Swamp Rabbit Trail Network. The network of the Swamp Rabbit Trail is now 22 miles long. That includes the green line and the orange line, and even a mile section down in Fountain Inn. So logistically, the, the way the trail came together is part of a national effort called Rails to Trails Conservancy. And so on the Rails to Trails Conservancy, individual communities can sign up for notification when rail lines are essentially being abandoned, no longer being used for rail transportation. And we were signed up on that list and back in the early 2000s, late 1990s, the community got notification that the owner of the rail was filing for abandonment. And what we did, it was created in 2009. We're now at 22 miles of the network, but the first nine miles were the trail between Traveler's Rest and Greenville. And we pulled up the rail and we just put down asphalt and turned it into a trail. Back in the 1880s is when the railroad got started, going between Greenville and Traveler's Rest with a goal of getting to Knoxville and a goal of getting to the ports around Charleston. Because it was a bunch of businessmen developing the corridor over the time and, and with funds available, it wasn't very smooth. And so people riding the train said it kind of hopped 
like the native swamp rabbit uh, up near Furman in the, in the swamps of the Piedmont. And so it just got nicknamed that. And it just, like the mayor of Greenville said, it was a sticky name. So the nickname of the, the railroad carried over to the nickname of the trail. So there's so many different ways that people use the trail system. When you sit for a few minutes even on a bench, anywhere on the trail, you start to notice crazy things like llamas. And we've had llamas, people walking their llamas on the trail. We have hand cyclists using it because it's a safe environment for hand cyclists. There are many people that don't have a car that use this as their transportation network to get to work and home. So really from a biking, walking, anything with wheels that is human powered is, is the broad use. Prior to the Swamp Rabbit Network, we had a growing bike culture because we had the amenities of the mountains, the Blue Ridge Escarpment, just destinations that were very attractive near the populations of Greenville and Traveler's Rest. I think really where the Swamp Rabbit came in is it gave a very enjoyable and inviting opportunity for families to teach kids how to ride. The fact that it's on an old rail bed, the Swamp Rabbit is, for the majority of the way, it's less than 5% grade, so it's very easy. Swamp Rabbit has definitely broaden the culture. We had a dedicated culture here with professional cyclists retiring here, but it allowed people to go, riding a bike is no longer just something I did as a kid. It's the way I can get around my neighborhood. It's the way I can go downtown to eat.